welcome to the class. Today, we are going to look at one specific aspect of language, which is learning to use language. We call it learning softening. It requires our attention to several aspects. We, be, we are basically talking about the dis differences between knowing something and knowing to use what we know. If we keep this distinction in mind, then we can see it applies to language learning as well. Let us talk directly about language. Learning grammatical structure, learning sounds, words, sentences, intricate details of sentences is one aspect of learning a language. This is about, this is learning about the language, learning the details of language and learning intricacies of language. But when we communicate with others, we need to know little more than these things. Because learning the structure and making attempts in learning these things is internal to us, internal to human mind. However, all aspects of communication involves others. So, when we speak, when we use the language, we talk to others. We talk to another person or a group of persons or a large audience. We are only going to look at just a few aspects and see how learning about these makes a difference in how we speak. So, we are going to divide it into two parts, knowing and using. That is, learning to know about something, know something in details and knowing to use what we know. So, how we use what we know makes a lot of difference. Let us look at just a few aspects of it, but as a word of caution, I must say right up front that these are tentative suggestions. Your own presence of mind, your own intuitive understanding of society and the context in which you use the language is going to be the best help to you. However, what we are going to show definitely going to help in forming certain patterns are certainly going to be indicative of what we must know about the use of language. Let us look at some of this. So, when we say we know, we know when we learn the language, we know the following we know about a sentence, we know that there are several types of sentences, we know there are word classes, we know there are word categories, we know there are grammatical categories, we know that there is a sentence which has got a subject and a predicate in it. We know that that is not enough because we need to know about the composition of a predicate as well. That is, in, within the predicates, we may have objects and we may also have adverbs. Objects are required elements, adverbs may not be required elements. These are the intricacies that we learn. We pay attention to them, we pay attention to examples, we see how our subconscious works with these things, we draw certain things from our own languages. and. Through this mechanism, we learn 
these details. We know about the complex sentences that when we have another sentence as an object of the verb in the predicate, the sentence becomes a complex one. We know that subject and predicate next to each other would not make a sentence. They are combined with certain other invisible and sometimes visible elements like agreement, which is basically a combination of number and person. Uh, gender is not so much important in English. Tense in terms of present, past and futures and certain aspects, all three of them, agreement, tense and aspects combine together and work in a very intricate way to put subject and predicate together to make a sentence. When, I, when we talk about these things, they sound too technical. They, they are, they require a description of how computation of language works within human mind. That is what we mean when we say we know. As a child, when we learn language before 15 years of age, this entire process is automatic. And when we learn, when we make an effort in learning after 15 years of age, we have to work on these things and thus we learn the language. But there is a purpose why we learn the language. The purpose is to speak, the purpose is to use. And when we use the language, we want to convey what we want to say and more importantly, we want to convey what we want to say properly, adequately and appropriately. These parts properly, adequately and appropriately comes from learning how we use them. And this depends on the context. And I am going to discuss a few contexts with you today to talk about this part of use of language in terms of properly, adequately and properly, adequately and appropriately. So, appropriateness is the key factor in the use of language. We, we want to become impactful in communication, that is when we speak with others. So, a combination of the two, that is learning about the grammaticality, that is accuracy with and when we combine them with appropriateness, the two things together becomes, when we put the two things together, then we become impactful. So, we to, to do so, we need to know how to say what we want to say. And the way we use the sentence makes all the difference. So, if, if we are not, if, if we are very grammatical and let, let me very, let me be very open about it. We need to be grammatical, we need to be accurate when we are speaking. Because if we are not accurate, if we are not grammatical, if we do not speak grammatically correct sentences, we leave a very strange impression and we, chances are that we will lose the audience and we do not convey what we want to say impactfully, particularly when we need the audience to listen to us. Please pay, pay attention to the footnote here. There are situations, there are contexts when we are in the audience and we are required and forced to listen to and understand whatever the speaker is saying. We, I am not talking about that situation. I am talking about the situation 
when we need to convey ourselves properly and we want full attention and we want the audience, we want the hearer to get our message appropriately, accurately. Under such circumstances, some of the th these things that we are going to discuss are going to be impactfully useful. In short, they can also be called certain aspects of common sense in language because the knowledge of context, that is the knowledge of use, is also something that children learn on their own. Grown-up people also learn them much faster and when they pay attention to that. However, combining them, combining the appropriateness in a new language with the structural patterns of, of accuracy is the key factor in this part. So, when we, when we say about, when we talk about softening, it is not just how we look, how we present ourselves, it is about how confident we sound when we talk and this confidence again requires both the sides proper, that is accuracy on one side and appropriateness on the other side and a proper combination of the two is going to make us impactful and confident. Hence, certain extra structural factors that we need to keep in mind are the following. So, we are going to take few examples of context and we are going to look at some of these helpful ways of saying things. So, what are the, the contexts are like questions, suggestions or requests or when we express our opinion, when we are talking about some issues or when we have to say no, that is when we have to, uh, we have a negative answer in the form of refusal. So, what are the things that we keep in mind in these contexts to make ourselves not sound so harsh? or uh, otherwise to the listener. Appropriateness is a key thing because it comes from a, a careful knowledge of the context. See, when we speak, there could be two broad contexts in that. One could be informal and the other is formal. However, I would like to bring this to your attention that even in the most informal contexts, we still need to employ a bit of formality. We, we need to bring in a bit of formality in the most informal contexts that we can imagine in our lives. That helps. I will add a footnote here. You know, when we speak, we want to sound natural. We want to sound, we, we, we want to, we, we want to sound as if we are, we are speaking effortlessly. So, becoming natural requires looking effortless, but we need to understand that it takes a lot of efforts to look effortless. It can be consistency over a long period of time or preparedness to look effortless. Hence, I meant that even in the most of informal contexts, bringing in little bit of formality makes it look impactful. Keeping that in mind, still there is a distinction between effortless, between informal and formal contexts. So, we, we are going to look at
few imperative sentences which are canonical examples of command and respect type of sentence. In our formal uh, instructions, we have, we have heard that there are some sentences which sound like command and there are some sentences which sound like request. And I want to present this distinction to you with the help of context, with the help of description of context and then you will be able to make a distinction that we, we need at most care with these things. Our own intuition and instinct within a specific context can guide us if we are careful about the choice of our structure. So, look at this. There could be a situation when we can say, give me a glass of water. But, and, and that is considered as not so respectful as an example of command. And the second one, please give me a glass of water, please give me a glass of water is considered an example of request. Now, what makes it a request? The fact that we are adding a, a, a term, a requestful term, please. It, it's a magical term in English and we need to use this. But even in an informal context, if you use it, it does not make it really informal. It is okay to use please in informal context as well. So, formally looking informal is going to make you look more impactful. We can say the other, other example we can take is meet with me at 9 in the morning. We can, we can use this sentence informally, casually. It is not a damaging sentence. It is not really a command. Preferably and particularly when we know the context and the hearer. Who we are saying this sentence to makes a huge difference. So, we can say, we can also say, please, with me, please meet with me at 9 in the morning. Mere absence or presence of please does not make it informal or formal, command or respect. It is how we say and to whom we say in what context makes it either one of the two. And please keep in mind, even please meet with me at 9 in the morning can be a good enough command. The only thing is you need to be imaginative enough for a con context. You need to create a context and that context can also vary from context to context. For example, imagine a situation, uh, uh, a war room type of a situation where the top army general is meeting with his lieutenants and he, they are discussing their strategies. At the end of that meeting, the general happens to tell a few of his colleagues who are hierarchically junior to him in, in certain sense that please meet with me at 9 in the morning. They can set up a whole new meeting or the general may want to know just a few of them at 9 in the morning. Given the context of army discipline and a war like war room like situation, this is not just a request to the lieutenants. This can be construed as a good enough command in the sense that the hearers, the lieutenants do not have an option 
to suggest an alternative time. So the general says, meet with me at 9 in the morning or please meet with me at 9 in the morning or the general can make it even more polite. Is it possible for us to meet in the morning at 9? All these things remain a command to the hearer. Think about a slightly different context which is not, not from the army context. It, it, let us imagine a context from the civil situation. These are the two terms that we use, uh, 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 civil and military situations. So I, I do not mean civil in any, any, in any other sense. So in a civil situation, with the hierarchy, it still applies the same way. But you can still imagine a possibility of suggesting some alternative of a meeting time. For example, if your boss tells you, let meet with me at 9 in the morning or please meet with me at 9 in the morning. Though both are kind of mandatorily required for you to meet with your boss in the morning, but depending upon what the boss chooses, what kind of sentence the boss chooses, you can decide your alternatives. So, and in a civil situation, it is possible to suggest an alternative. Yes, sir, is it is 9.30 okay? However, so, so the point that I am trying to make, these, these things are totally context dependent and it is the context that is to whom and where we speak or we hear such sentences. I, I hope this command and respect type of situation is, is clear to us. So, the it is, however, it is true that to make you make yourself sound softer in a, in a, in a normal situation, you could use sentences like, could we meet at 9 in the morning? Could we meet at 9 in the morning, please? And third one, so, so look at this, look at the differences between the two. The third one is, I was wondering if we could meet at 9 in the morning. They are, so first one is definitely polite, second one is more polite in that hierarchy and third one is it is excessively polite a situation. Now it is not that those who use first one are not polite people. It is you, you, we need to pick one out of the three depending on the context. For example, we can say instead of saying meet with me at 9 in the morning, we can choose to say could we, could we meet at 9 in the morning. However, if we are asking for a meeting where we, I am not in a situation to to ask, to, to tell people to meet with me, we can say, could we please, could we meet at 9 in the morning please? That sentence can make your hearer think about your request more sympathetically. And the third one is definitely used to give an option to the hearer and giving an option to the hearer in the sense that I was wondering uh, if we could meet at 9 in the morning. Giving an, giving an option to the, to the hearer buys you certainty. You are being flexible, but by being flexible, you are not allowing the hearer to be in a position to say no. 
So, look at the look at the impact of this. If if we are talking in a non-hierarchical situation or or in a in a in, in a in a formal situation which is not really hierarchical, by using the one at in the higher degree of politeness buys you more than you can actually get. So, so it is it is in our favor to pick one over the other. However, we can determine the context in which we can pick one over this other. So, that is that is the these are just a few soft versions available for us to use. Sometimes we are in a context when we are either we solicit suggestions or we are asked for suggestions or in a conversation we find a situation where we need to uh, suggest something. So, I, I just picked up a sentence imagine uh, in a in a even in an informal situation your friend asks you a question shall I invest in mutual funds. What could be your possible answers? No, you should not. It is a fairly grammatical sentence, a good enough suggestion, good enough advice. You can rationalize your advice. Uh, by the way, this has nothing to do with investment or no investment. I am just using a context. So, there is nothing wrong in saying so. It is a fully grammatical sentence. And this is where appropriateness comes in. But you would agree with me that such a sentence, no, you should not, is rather more abrupt than a suggestion. It is way too direct where listener may not be ready to take that suggestion. So, what are our alternatives? A, it is, it is too direct it is too abrupt though it is grammatical. So, he, here is important part grammaticality is not enough. Grammaticality is required, but it is not enough. Acceptability and appropriateness has to be topped up on grammaticality. So, this, this is where we see the actual role of acceptability. We talk a lot about grammaticality versus acceptability and this is the key point where we see the acceptable role. Even in an informal situation you want to suggest something and you want to be heard, one needs to find a less direct and impactful way. If you practice that, we are going to sound more impactful because the ultimate purpose of what we say must be the, the sentences must be grammatical, but we want to we want to leave an impact with those things. So, if you however, you can express the same sentiments in different words saying I think mutual funds are not doing good these days. You are you are not how do we become direct? by not saying yes or no. How, how do we become not so direct? One way of doing so is by not saying yes or no. Rather, you, you just express your opinion. So, which, so, when you say, I do not think mutual funds are doing good these days, in that situation, we are definite, you are definitely indicating your answer towards a negative one. You can, you can be little more direct in that also and say, if I were you, I would not. But think about it, it still sounds little abrupt and direct because it has a negative word in it. You can say, if I were you, I would think several times about it. If I were you, I would think several times about it. 
that is a clear suggestion towards no. And it is not abrupt, it is not direct and it allows the hearer options. It, it allows the hearer to derive from your suggestions that you are not being imposing. You are not imposing your suggestion on your hearer, on your audience. That is, that is key in making ourselves softer. We can take a context from an issue and so, so look, when we discuss issues, look at a situation. Somebody comes to you and it, it could be a hierarchical situation because hierarchy in society is a very normal thing. Society is excessively hierarchical. There could be contexts where we can create a non-hierarchical situations. We, we, we discuss those things at some other point, but let us look at, let us focus at the main point in discussing issues. Somebody comes, somebody has sent you a report. Uh, we, you need to meet with a group of people and you need to discuss that. But before that, it so happens that the person who has sent you a report wants to say or happens to say that, sir, I have submitted my reports on accounts. Hope you liked it or hope you had a chance to look at it. What is the purpose of this information? There are several purposes, but two of them are quite clear. One is the person wants you to know, even though you already know that the, that person has finished the job. Mind it, it is also one of the informal ways of saying something when you run into each other. This is that itself could be an instance of softening ourselves and understanding contexts, understanding situations and what to say in that situation. You, don't, you, you may not want to compliment the person on, on his dresses or you may not want to say anything else. Rather, you would want to say something that is common between two of you. Hope you liked it. You are giving an option. Hope you had a chance to look at it. You are just checking if that person has to say something. Then that person and tells you, you have made a mistake in calculations. Means, yes, I have had a look at it. I had a chance to look at it. You have made a mistake in calculations. You have ruined it. Either one of the two responses or one of the two is devastating in nature. This is, these are grammatical sentences again for the purpose of discussing. There is nothing wrong in use, in the, nothing ungrammatical about these sentences, but they are not appropriate sentence in the context because your purpose is not to devastate your listener. You can express the same thing in different ways and we can be more creative, wiser and use our knowledge of the context and our knowledge of the society to, to put that for softening how we say the same thing. We can say, you seem to, be, you seem to have missed a few things. May I suggest a revisit? Is it possible for you to relook at this and send it to me again? You are conveying the same message that there are some problems with the reports that you have sent. And if you want my opinion on that, can, may I suggest some revisit of that? The message is loud and clear, but it is way softer. It is not diversity. Now, this is where people say, understanding these parts are extra grammatical, extra linguistic, in the sense that it is not really about language, 
it is not really it understanding these aspects are not really embedded within language but they are uh, understanding the context under the understanding the society is not really part of how we learn language that's not really true understanding communicative competence understanding how we communicate how we re remain impactful how we not how we do not lose people must be one of our goals in communication you don't want to lose your audience the least that we can say is when somebody talks to you at the end of the conversation you do not want the hearer the audience to feel bad even if it was not so pleasant you can have a good conversation you can you can give the feel of a good conversation to your speaker to your hearer as a speaker at this point it is important to be again grammatically accurate plus communicatively appropriate this the second part comes only after the first one so the the other other response could be it appears to me that calculations do not add up could you please take a look at it again this is a detailed comment on the report so so these are the 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 ways of becoming softer you can take your use your own intuition and see which one would you prefer in given a situation the refuse one yet another concept context refusal which is basically saying no is slightly tough one people usually do not want to say no but more often than not we have to we have to say that it's it's not difficult you can you can say that but it requires a skill to say no without having said no and again that is the combination of the two linguistic skills as well as communicative confidence to to build your communicative communicative confidence you need that communicative skill so if you have a question somebody runs into you and asks you can we go for a cup of tea what are your options you can either say yes or no how do you say that you you depend again depending upon the context you can choose various kinds of answers could you please bring me some story books on your way this is this is asking for a favor maybe not in so nice way look at the sentence it it's a very nice request could you could you please bring some story books on your way if you happen to say no to both how what are the ways of becoming creative so we we can say things like i have a lot of stuff pending to take care of you can say more things but this much is good enough uh it it says no without saying no that is it says it gives the same sense just that we are not using a negative sentence it's a still an affirmative sentence but it it's a it it gives the sense of no i have a lot of stuff pending to take care of hope you won't won't mind what what would you not mind you would not mind the sense that is emerging out of it as a response to the question can we go for a cup of tea which is no no i can't also keep in mind you in order to express refusal you don't have to say the factually correct uh, factually correct information the re the response to the other question could you please bring me some story books on your way you can say i'll try my best it's a it's a good sentence it's a grammatical sentence a short sentence 
But when, we, when you say that, it gives the sense of, it says I'll try, but it clearly gives a sense that chances are you will not bring. If you want to bring, employ a little more clarity in that, you can say, the this, this shop seems to have moved as I couldn't find it. This says a lot about it, but basically it's more, more of no. I am not sure if there is any bookstore on my way. This is way more direct. Now, I am I'm, I'm not discussing the ways of, to use the word lying, but the knowledge of the context and the situation in which you need to use these sentences would probably require you to say some of these things. It's still useful in the sense that saying no, 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 I could not, no, I cannot drink, or no, I cannot go for a cup of tea. Though grammatical, but not appropriate sentences, won't buy you much. So these are not the ways of lying, but these are ways of communication, where the idea is to convey the sense as a response to the question and particularly this is a useful skill in saying no to something. So again, there, these are just a few situations that I created, just a few sort of possible, uh, sit, possible answers in those contexts. I have tried to describe the context to you, but as I said, the, the things that we have discussed uh, for today is basically, we need to be aware of the context. And there is no specific rule that makes us aware of the context. And being and becoming softer in communication is really a social skill, but ultimately, but a, a essential thing for our communication for becoming impactful. It's a, it's a social skill, it requires linguistic competence and a combination of the two, that is the combination of grammatical rules and these kinds of social skills makes us effective makes us effective communicator. These things might sound as cliche to you, but keeping them in mind time and again and thinking about strategies is going to help you. Now, I, I, I would like to draw your attention to the following. You might have already been doing these things a lot. This, this is not something that you have to wait to learn to do. Other people may be using these sentences with you. Here on, I would like you to pay attention to these sentences, these contexts and see, can you be more creative, innovative? Do people become more creative and innovative? Make a list of those situations. Make a list of the possible answers in those situations and see how, how impactful that in turn makes you in becoming, uh, in, in deploying communicative effectiveness to develop your confidence in communication. Thank you so much. Look forward, looking forward to a discussion with you on these things. Until then, bye-bye.